Shalom Chavrin. God bless you, and I am so uh, glad to be able to see you guys. Well, I don't see you. You see me, and I uh, apologize for it being that way. Uh, anyway, there are a lot of things that have been happening in the world. As you well know, Satan has been done everything he knows to do to uh, try to stop us from what we do here. And so uh, we're just trying to get back on board, get the message out to you guys what's going on. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a uh, news brief as well as uh, a, a teaching that's really heavy on my heart for my Jewish brethren. Uh, just for you guys that you're aware of already, and I know many of you guys already know this, uh, we know that the three Israeli teens were laid to rest in Israel. Um, that was uh, Gilad, Naftali, and Frankel. Uh, excuse me, Ayal. Uh, Naftali, Frankel, and Ayal. Uh, the emergency phone recording of them and what happened to them was released also publicly as a very, um, very disheartening phone call. We, we learned from that that they were killed almost immediately after they were kidnapped. Uh, one of the boys that was trying to place an emergency phone call, his phone went for two minutes, and so they were able to pick that up. Um, Guglio Miotti, uh, a friend of ours, wrote a report on Israel's national news, and in that he reports in there the goodwill gesture. It's actually the article was published on July 3rd of 2014, and the uh, title of his report is Israel's Goodwill Gestures Increase Jewish Bloodlust. Um, Gulio really exposes what the Vatican is doing, their intentions there, as well as Barry Chamish. And I encourage you, uh, Barry Chamish has a new book out called Saving Israel, uh, as well as Gulio Miotti writes about the Vatican and what they're doing to Israel. Look up both these men, get their books. And I, and I say this, you have to understand, I don't say this to try to promote somebody about buying books and stuff like that. I'm telling you this because we're living in such a critical hour right now that we have no idea. I, I, although I know I can't fathom the seriousness of this hour that we're in. And so I, I strongly, I strongly urge you to, to get the books uh, and, and see what's going on and make preparations because um, a lot of evil is coming against us very, very soon, my friends. And so, um, so I need to, to discuss this with you, especially my Gentile friends, the Christians that love Israel. Uh, you guys really need to be brought up to speed about what's going on. It's a very serious hour that we're living in. And by the way, uh, that, that brings me to another point there too. I'd mentioned to you in a video um, that we're gonna really, we really do need your help uh, financially as well as getting this video out to as many people as you possibly can. And I don't say that lightly. I don't say that to try to 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 be some somebody. I just I feel so strong in my heart about the hour we're living in that it, to me every moment that I can I've got to get you guys updated about what's going on in the world, as well as as the Lord is leading me. To, to teach everything that I can for your sake as well. Uh, I'm hoping to have Barry Chamish on before too long here as well as Guglio Miotti will be back on with us uh, before long. Alan Lamont also will be on. Hopefully I'll get Alan in today. Uh, we have Gary Skagibo coming in this evening uh, that we'll, we'll be bringing you guys up today about the historical facts that have happened. Uh, uh, and, and the reason I'm bringing you into the history is because we need to understand some of the history to know what's happening in the world today. Uh, but anyway, Guglio's report there, he writes about how that um, we know that in a 1997 book uh, by Benjamin Netanyahu, he had swore he had never released any terrorists, and yet he has released more terrorists than any other prime minister as of, as of this date. Not to mention, uh, he removed 400 checkpoints. And one of the checkpoints, that there were several checkpoints coming from uh, Gaza into the West Bank south of Hebron, this is where it is believed that the terrorists that, that kidnapped uh, the three uh, teens, uh, Gilad, Naftali, and uh, Iyal, were, they actually used this to escape back into Gaza to, to avoid uh, prosecution. Uh, but anyway, he wrote a very nice article. I think it would be worth for you to take the time to read it. Um, at any way, we know that there are... There's, all kinds of violence going on in Israel. There's a lot of escalation with riots. This is all planned. And that's why 
I'm not just going to report to you, but I mean, we've had an unbelievable number of rockets from Gaza coming into Israel. Uh, the world's not going to tell you about this type of, you know, the, the, the modern day media, MSNBC, by the way, and I'm going to play you a clip here in just a couple of seconds, but MSNBC, they immediately, when they talk about the death of this uh, little Arabic boy that was a teen, they immediately suggest that it's Jewish people that did it. Well, ironically, the father of this young man, in a separate interview from his mother, says that he knows, he witnessed it, that it was Arabic men that kidnapped his son. But his mother gives a totally different tale altogether. So it's propaganda. It's media propaganda trying to make the Jews look bad. At any hand, we have... Uh, the, the, the rockets coming in, uh, the riots that have just really, not, not just uh, Jerusalem and East Jerusalem, but now they're breaking out in the north part of the country as well, in Arabic neighborhoods there where there's a stronger hold, and it's just, it's just kind of getting really chaotic. So uh, without, for, without getting further into the news issues right now, um, I need to speak to you really heart to heart. I need to speak to you, uh, the Christian people, as well as my rabbinical brethren. You, this passage here, it has a compound meaning, what I'm going to read you. But I'm going to show you some timelines that are going on. And, um, and, 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 and uh, my mind is in so many different directions because we're so far behind with all the events that have been taking place with the attack on us. Our, our internet cable was cut in half. Uh, mysteriously, it, it, you know, it's kind of interesting, you know, I asked the, the gentleman that replaced the wire, he says, you know, I, I can't understand why it would be cut in half. Well, it's kind of ironic, our, our, our website is destroyed, our internet cable is cut, um, a lot of other things that, you know, I'm not, I can't go into every detail of the things that happened to us basically in one day, uh, because I don't want the enemy to know where he's effective at in all areas. Anyway, Revelation 18.4, very familiar scripture with many of you guys. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. We know this is speaking of the Vatican. I'm not going to go into the long details of that as of right now, but hopefully as I begin to really start teaching some depth to you guys, I can go into this a little bit later uh, and break down some of this uh, writings and revelation. Uh, I don't normally get as deep into the uh, aspect of, of prophecy uh, other than prophecy that Delil, uh, is directly related to Israel, but this prophecy is to Israel, and it is to you as Christians. Come out of her, my people. Pardon me, let me kill the sound on this here. Come out of her, my people. Come out, who is her? This great heart, of, this great whore, this mystery Babylon. You know, if, it, if John says it's mystery Babylon, then you have to understand it has nothing to do with the Babylonian kingdom that is in Iraq or that was in Iraq, that was, that was so powerful many, many years ago. The mystery Babylon, if it's a mystery Babylon, then there's a reason why it's a mystery. We know that it says that she sits on seven hills. Now, some people want to say, oh, because there's such a push to get you guys to believe in an Islamic antichrist. The Mahdi, or, or you know, the uh, the Caliphate, this guy that has been declared the Caliphate in the group ISIS. Wait till I get Alan Lamont on with with me here. Alan is really going to bring you in some information that'll just it'll just it'll blow your mind away. Um, but at any rate, though, let me just tell you, though, that one other time that a caliphate was declared was back in the 7th century. And this was when the Pope of Rome had control because he created the Muslim religion. And he had control of them. And what was, what was the caliphate for then? He was the general to the Pope to kill off the true believing Christians, which were all Jews. Well, back then it was a mix of Gentile and Jew, but he was trying to wipe out the Jewish believers who were having great success through northern Africa and through the, through the Middle East winning Arabic people to Yeshua. So that's why he had a caliphate. He had a general. And again, here we are at the very closing hours of the days, and they wonder why they got a caliphate. Look, the whole idea of, oh my gosh, I get so many people, oh my gosh, Brother Steve, you're, you're, you're missing it. I mean, uh, Wally Shabbat, he was right. I mean, look at this. He's going to attack Rome. 
are you guys really serious? I mean, you, you really believe this. A little small little army that Israel could wipe out by themselves easily. Oh, yeah, you know, I, I realize Obama did leave them some tanks over there and, and the Vatican made sure they had some funds over U.S. dollars in the bank over there in Iraq uh, to fund them with. Uh, of course, they say they stole. They didn't steal the money. I mean, come on, give me a break. How did they know where the money was? Why was there that much American cash in this particular bank? You know, why did Obama... You know, world leaders are appointed. You have to understand, they're not elected. You just, we, just, we just fall in for the idea of democracy to really believe that that's so. It's not so. They're appointed. Obama was appointed, and everybody was say, oh, he's an antichrist, he's an antichrist. Now you're ISIS guy, now he's the antichrist. Oh, he's a caliphate, he's the antichrist, he's the antichrist. Uh, do you guys not realize this was the whole, I mean, this was the other intention for creating the Muslim religion was to get the people's eyes off the Vatican back then when they were saying that the, that the Pope is the Antichrist and to put it on someone else. If they wrote the Bible, and by the way, it really bothers me, I shouldn't, that's not a Bible anyway, the Quran is not a Bible. If they wrote the Quran, because Muhammad couldn't read or write, hello, they had some nice little guys over there and uh, some... Uh, some of the little Jesuits of that, well, he wasn't really considered Jesuits back then, but uh, they had some of the Catholic people over there, bishops there, whatever you want to call them, that were in northern Africa that, that tutored him along to be able to, to create this uh, Bible for the Muslims as we were to have it. But anyway, uh, they, they saw in Muhammad a charismatic leader that would bring attention off of them and, and in, in doing so in the writings, now, I have to remember, a lot of the writings, even after the Quran, in the secular writings and Muslim writings, this is where we get the Mahdi and things like this. And what's so ironic is so many Christians, instead of quoting your Bible, instead of taking this as the infallible word of God, you're taking the writings of the Muslim people, the Quran, and you're, and you're basing your fundamental beliefs, your eschatology, if you would, off of nonsense. I mean, what has happened to the minds of the people? I mean, are, you, are, are, we, that, are we that stricken down? Are we that bewitched by Jezebel that we do not seem to understand what truth is anymore? I mean, we have got a decree, and I am I'm working on right now. I've had some people send me more information about this decree that the Pope has given to all the 501c3 uh, uh, churches out there that they've got one year to comply and to come home to the Mother Rome. In fact, today, I'm on the, I'm on the Internet with a friend of ours in Slovakia, and, and we were told that they are, they are marching through the streets, the Catholics and the Protestants, evangelicals, saying, we are all one. We are now united. She's the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Why do you think the people keep coming to her? Why does everybody bow down to the Pope? And you're looking for some guy to raise up in the Muslim world to become the world leader who's going to be charismatic and bring about a one world religion when you see in plain before your eyes the Pope has made a one world religion called Chrislam. Who was it that invited the Muslims, the Jews, the, 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 not just Shimon Perez, but also uh, he invited the Arabic leaders and he invited the rabbinical leaders and the Christian leaders and they come over to the Vatican for what? A ceremony together, a prayer meeting. You show me a Muslim guy that can get that to happen, who can get the Jews and the Catholics and all that together. Oh, I'm sorry, the Jehovah's Witness group, right? Yeah, sorry about that. I, I miss that one altogether. That one just flew over my head. You know, guys, listen. You guys that are listening, I know many of you guys, you got it right. You know what the truth is. But remember, the video goes out to a lot of people, guys. A lot of other people will watch this video. And, and I know most of you guys that are watching right now, you know the truth. You know what's right. And that's why you, you, you support what we're doing. You, you, that's why you're, 
your love for us is the way it is. You know, you want someone that'll tell you the truth. I'm, I'm not, I mean, there's too many preachers out there. Let me just say this right now. I, I'm not going to, I'm not here to play games. I'm not here to play church with anybody. There's too many preachers out there right now. They're, they'll go out there and say, don't say nothing against the Catholics and don't say nothing against the Pentecostals. And, you know, we're all one. We're brothers. We're sisters and everything. Let me tell you something. A true brother and a true sister right now is going to come out of the nonsense that they're in. You know, and I know a lot of people say, Brother Steve, should we, should we still continue to go to church? Go to church as long as they'll let you to. But remember one thing, every 501c has got to join. They got one year to join the church. You want to get a mark of the beast? Believe me, that's coming. It's coming. I know some people that believe, I've got dear brothers out there and sisters as well that believe that Sunday is the mark of the beast, you know. Uh, I agree that they're going to force their Sunday rule as well. I'm not saying that. I can't personally pin down what the actual mark is. I've told you years ago when I first started teaching on the mark of the beast, I never believed that a microchip itself was the mark of the beast, although I said to you a microchip or something like that could facilitate their control. Yes, I do believe that. But I've always told you that if God marked the Jews in their forehead... And he put a seal on them. We know it's not a literal mark on the Jews' forehead. Okay? But what is it? It's the Holy Ghost. It's God give them the Holy Spirit. Why the forehead? Because with your mind, with your brain, you have, to, you have all kinds of thoughts coming at you. You have Satan bringing his thoughts. The Holy Ghost bringing his thoughts. And you have to, from your mind, inside of this part of your head, and I don't know what, how the brain is made up. Maybe, maybe up here in the front of your brain somewhere is where you make that decision to accept or reject the thought that comes to your head. But whatever you accept, and, I, and I could, I'll prove this to you that it's true. You want to see it's true? You take, you take a, uh, I don't care if it's a man or a woman. Let's just use theft the, 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 the for, for, for example. Now, most of you guys, sisters, brothers, you, you've probably never gone through that in your life. But, but maybe you have. Maybe there's been a time in your life. And so you could relate this, whether it be stealing or whatever it is, you could relate to this. Has there ever been a time in your life where a thought come in your mind, and I'll use stealing like, like shoplifting or something like that. A thought comes in your mind, you don't have the money, but you want that item. Oh, and, and, and then the other thought comes in there, oh, that's not right. That's not right. I shouldn't do that. Oh, I sure wish I had that, though. See, what happens? Somewhere inside of this brain here, there comes a decision that makes either accepts that thought or rejects that thought. But whenever the, de the decision is made, your hands will go to action. So if you accept it, you know, let's say you're a little kid and you're in a store and you ain't got no money and, and uh, you know, and you just reach down there and it's like, oh, and you, your hand takes it. Then your other hand's got to help you hide that rascal. You see, that's what I'm talking about. See, you, that's where the head and the hand come into play. In the case here with the mark of the beast in the last days, we're seeing the Vatican wants to control the world economic system. And nobody has more money than the Vatican does, in both in stocks, bonds, gold, Hard assets in the Vatican, more gold because they got all the statues and, 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 and pagan items in the entire world. You know, you don't want me to get into that one, I guarantee you that. I, I, I'm not, like I said, I'm not here to play. I'm not here to play games with, 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 with people at all. You know, the thing is, you guys listen because you want somebody that will tell you the truth and not beat around the bush. I'm not going to sensationalize things. I'm not going to tell you, oh, gosh, look at this cloud over here. Oh, wow, it's, it's, it's a biblical prophecy. Or, or No, sir. I'm going to tell you the truth with everything i got in me. Let me see. There's something here. I, I want to share something with you. And let me just see if I've got it. Well, I, I don't have it right here. But let me just, let me just, let me just explain, explain something to you here. I got it. I got a... Uh, it's funny how this happened. I got two packages in the mail recently from some rabbi out in Arizona. All right? I'm not going to call his name. He's a third. Whatever his name, Rabbi so-and-so the third. Uh, if you get anything from somebody like that and you're concerned about it, write me. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about the man. But anyway, it's kind of ironic the way that God worked this out. This man had sent me two different packages, and I don't think he meant to send them out at the same time. 
But undoubtedly, it got sent out that way. And he had wrote me a hand note in both of his packages here. And he told me that, you know, he'd watched the videos here. Uh, you're a good man. I know you're trying hard and everything, but uh, you're looking for the two witnesses. And I'm here to tell you that I'm one of them. And he went on to tell me, and this is what's interesting in this, he went on to tell me that everything I was doing was wrong, that I'm in the paganistic Jewish beliefs, I'm a, uh, just like the pagan Gentiles, he goes into all this, and he told me, he says, you, your calendar's totally wrong, you're using a Catholic calendar, your Jewish calendar, that's all wrong, you know, I know all the calendars are wrong, I'm not here to, to argue that, but he says, my family, we know the truth, and we know the calendar and everything, and 5993 on the Jewish calendar, this so-and-so so is going, or not the Jewish calendar, but on the calendar they come up with, this, is, this and this is going to happen. It'll be the start of tribulation. And he really gives me a hard way to go in his letter, and he sent me a little pamphlets and stuff, you know, a little full-size page pamphlet and stuff of what's going to happen and when this is going to happen and when that's going to happen. And then I opened the other package, and he says, 5993, did the, th the events that we anticipated to happen did not happen. So I, I wrote you another le letter to show you what, what you said. We thought it would happen, but it didn't. But now I'm writing you to tell you what's going, what, what will happen. Hello. I mean, clearly, the Tanakh right here. God says, stone the man and kill him. He tells me he's a prophet. He tells me that he is one of the two witnesses and that he's looking for his, his, uh, his genetic brother to go to Israel and will be there within nine months, prophesies, telling me that a certain thing is going to happen in 5993, and then he has to write me another letter said, I'm sorry it didn't happen, but now I'm going to tell you the way it's going to be now. Do you think I'm going to believe this? I... You know, friends, I don't know who the two witnesses are. I have no idea who they are. And I speak about them mainly because they're in the Word of God, and I know that it's going to happen, and it's going to happen soon. So I do speak about that. I've had many people contact me telling me they are the, the two witnesses. Um, I've had people contact me telling me that I'm one of the witnesses. Well, God's never told me nothing like that. But I am your brother, that I am that. You know, and I don't even really claim to be a rabbi. A lot of people call me a rabbi. I, I am your brother. I am Jewish. I am from the Le Levitical line. That is true. So I guess if I was still Jewish and, and not a believer in Yeshua, then yes, people would probably call me a rabbi. That's probably true. And, and I'm not against people doing that. I know some people say, oh, Steve, you shouldn't, people shouldn't call you a rabbi and everything. Jesus said, let no man call you rabbi, therefore. You know, li read what all he said about that. It's really the same thing with pastor as well. Because why? He says, because they love to be called in the markets rabbi and to be heard of their long prayers. I have no desire for any of this. I prefer to be called brother because I love you. And I know you love me, and that's the way I prefer things to be. Anyway, I, I really didn't mean to get into all this here. I just, there's so much on my heart, guys. Anyway, so we know about come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins. Now, he's actually, this is more specifically to the Jewish people. Why do we know this? Because Israel is the one that makes the covenant with the Vatican. And he's telling Israel, come out of her. As Gentiles, you're supposed to know better. But, okay. Now, so we, we know that there. I want to take you. Um, and I actually did this video last night, believe it or not, but the, again, Satan attacked uh, the way things were going, and for some reason the audio would not upload on YouTube. So um, as soon as I saw that, I, I had to stop it, but I finally, I think I figured out where the problem was and we got that resolved. So let me take you through some several verses here, though, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, now, we see that he's, the important part is, not only does it come out of her, my people, but notice what he says, and be ye not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. That's the important part. You receive not of her plagues. Now, let's jump over here to Revelation 11. We know that it says that there's going to be a temple built, the temple of God. Uh, he says, measure it out, but he says, the outer court which is with, within, without the temple, leave out. Measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. That's verse 2, by the way. 
and the holy city shall they tread underfoot for 42 months. That's three and a half years. So we know that the Vatican, half of Daniel's 70th week is going to tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months or three and a half years. Then he says, I will give power to my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Now, nowhere does it say in the scripture when they come. Now, I know Brother Rob Conrad, we talked about this, and Brother Rob said he believes this in the last half of the, of the 70th week of Daniel. And, and he may be right. I, I really tried to figure this one out myself, and I can't really myself come to that conclusion, uh, mainly because after their death, then there's still yet another vial to be poured out. Uh, and some more things actually happen. So if they're in the middle and they witness exactly three and a half years and the first three and a half years has already passed and the seven years is over, then how do we have any time left over? That's the reason why I'm not sure about that. Uh, but at one point, it looks like they don't come at the beginning either. So I'm really kind of confused on their, the order of when they come. But anyway, watch what he says here. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now, keep in mind, I have really wondered, knowing that what's happening to Israel, the riots in Israel, all this unrest right now, this is orchestrated. This is a campaign that is orchestrated by the Vatican because they're trying, or not trying, they're tr they're gonna, they want to bring Israel to their knees to make the Pope become the savior of the world. He will be the peacemaker. I believe this is the reason ISIS was, was built up by the Vatican. They're, they're trying to rally the Muslim world to do what? To come and attack Israel again. You have to understand, if you, if you read the book, and I've not got to read the whole thing, I've just got little excerpts here and there from uh, Barry Chamish, an interesting point he brings in there, 1967, that's what the Vatican, the, the Vatican had orchestrated this battle as well, but they didn't expect God to intervene. And when God intervened, it turned the battle the other way around. Now keep in mind, we got some bad Jews in politics in Israel as well. Shimon Perez is not the only bad, bad egg in this group over there, by the way, friends. He's not. But there are some serious Jesuits in there. And the good politicians that get in there find out that if they don't obey what they have in mind, they and their families will be killed. So you wonder what happened to Yitzhak Rabin? You wonder what happened to um, um, Ariel Sharon? Hmm. That's interesting, isn't it? It's funny how Shimon Perez just had tea with Ariel Sharon and suddenly the man ends up into a coma. And Barry Chalmers proves that Shimon Perez was involved in the assassination against Yitzhak Rabin. It's a very sinister thing that is going on in Israel, very sinister. And, a, and it's demonic to the very core. It's coming to America too, by the way. And, by, and, and to, you, we look at what's going on in, in America with the border, with the little Mexican children coming across and stuff like that. And, and, and it's kind of odd. I wonder who pays the people to hate these children. You know, now it was wrong for Obama to just open up the borders and everything. I agree with that. But who pays these people to hate this so much? You know, yes, it's causing a problem in America, no doubt about it. But the problem is, is they've got your eyes so honed in on these little kids and these people hating these kids for coming into the United States. And while your brains are all over there and they bring all the border police over here, Obama's slipping in all the little Sunni Muslims, the ISIS groups that he's creating for America to kill all the true Christians that love Israel, to kill the Jews. Do you know that they're going, they, this is not a joke. This is not, this is not hearsay. They're going to take, when the time comes and Jews are trying to return to Israel to be able to go and fight for their own country, for their love for them, they're going to close the airports down. They're going to kill. They're going, they're going to imprison Jews. And if you try to financially help the Jews over there, they're going to shut you down too. This is why I've always told you guys, if you ever want to do something for the Jewish people, if you want to do something, it's just like with Joseph. Joseph was bringing in to the storehouse so that when the time come when his brothers 
and sisters would come, there would be food for them. And so the Gentiles were bringing in, they were bringing in the grain, bringing in the grain, preparing, because Joseph already knew there was a great famine coming. There was going to be seven years of really bad things that were going to happen. Now, it also helped feed the Gentiles in that case too. And many people are smart enough to realize that we got some bad things going to hit America and they've stocked up on things. They've made preparations for that. But you know what Israel's looking for? They're just looking for their God. They're looking for their Mashiach. Who's making the preparations for them to hear the word of God? You see, the difference is with Joseph in his day, the Gentiles of Joseph's day had no idea that they were storing up grain that was going to bless his own brethren. But the difference is, is we do know that. In Revelation 11, we find that these have the power to shut the heaven that it rained not in the days of their prophecy. That's exactly what Elijah did. And who was Elijah dealing with? Ahab, who married Jezebel. Who's, who's the Ahab of today? Shimon Perez. And what has he done? He's married Jezebel, the Vatican, and brought idolatry into Israel. Do you not realize that God is resetting the whole world stage as it was 2,000 years ago? Now, I've got, I've got people that are Jewish that were friends of mine that hate, have hated me for making the stand that I have that Israel has allowed idolatry to come in and they've allowed the Vatican to take control. Take it up with God's word then. Some of those same friends, the people that were Jewish that were friends of mine at one time, you know, it's kind of ironic. They don't really believe the Christian Bible, no way. It's kind of like there's ministers out there on the internet that claim to be ministers of the gospel and claim to tell you about keeping the feast and stuff like that. And they call this book right here, the Tanakh, they call it written and inspired by demons or, or I don't know, fallen angels. I think, I think those of you that may know who I'm talking about, you don't, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. And, 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 and I'm not going to call a name on that, but let me just tell you something. I did reach out to that person personally because I'd heard so much people say this. And, and I thought, and I kept asking, have you guys gone to the brother and talked to him to reconcile him to see maybe this is something that was repented and was put off in the past? Well, no, it definitely wasn't repented. I can guarantee you that because I did reach out and I was flat out. I was, I was cut down right for even asking about it. So no, this is not written by demons. I was told I was not on the spiritual level to be able to, to discuss this. Well, okay then. Well, that's all right. I, I haven't reached that, that spiritual level. I guess you have to reach a demonic level to be able to do that. You, you know, if the, if, if the, if the Torah... If the, if the prophets and the writings that make up the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible, if this is all written by demons, then we're all lost and going to hell. What do you preach to Yeshua for then? I mean, that's like stupid. I mean, that's like saying, I mean, the whole Christian Bible is based on this book here. Yeshua quotes from the very book that is said, that is, oh, I won't get into that. All right, guys. I say enough for you to know, if you know people that teach this way, get away from them as far as you possibly can. I'm getting into some serious issues, guys, because you need to know what's truth and you need to know now. This is one reason why I'm telling you, I've got to go with all my heart full time. My wife said, look, we've got to move out of the house we're in, whatever we can do to cut costs to be able to do it. You know, we're, we're trying to get back into Israel, to stay in Israel there. We know that the government won't just up and let me do that. So we're having to play hopscotch back and forth. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is right now until God opens that door for permanency. But, you know, it's funny. Here we are looking to go back into Israel right here at the 1st of September. It's kind of like suicide, I guess. I don't know what's wrong with me, but there's some reason I feel like I have to be home for my people's sake. And, 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 and so I, I don't know what will happen. I have no idea. But I know a lot of the rabbis over there. I know them very well. And I want them to recognize who the Messiah is. That's my desire. You know, 
And, and what's funny, I know that God is going to send the two witnesses, you know, but, but maybe it's like Paul. You know, Paul was like a carryover in between the Jews and the Gentiles. There was a space of time where God continued to work with the Jews. Even though Yeshua had died and they had rejected him as a whole, God used that man to be able to, to witness and win more Jews to Yeshua, and then eventually the gospel changed over. Maybe this is what this is. Maybe this is the part of the ministry that we have here is, it, is like a carryover. I, I don't know, friends. I have no idea. Um, anyway, and I, and I keep sidetracking you guys. I'm sorry. I, I don't want to cause this to where it messes up what I'm trying to tell you here. Anyway, they have power to shut the heavenly rain, not in the days of their ministry. Clearly, Elijah. Okay, and have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now, to smite the earth with plagues? Does anybody not know what Moses' ministry was about? He turned the water to blood and he brought, I mean, all together, the, the water to blood was one of the plagues as well, but brought 10. Why does he say he turns the water to blood? He's trying to show you the identity who the witness is. Now, me personally, I know there's a lot of people that say it's got to be uh, Elijah and Enoch because they never die and they got to come back and die. Uh, okay. Listen, it, did you ever consider that maybe it's not even the literal? The witnesses are not the literal ones. Have you ever considered that maybe like Elisha became Elijah, so to speak? And it wasn't that it was reincarnation. No. But the same Holy Ghost with the same type of anointing that was on Elijah got on Elisha. The same thing happened to John the Baptist. And then Yeshua even says in the Christian Bible, when they ask him, I thought the scripture said that Elias was supposed to come first. According to Malachi's prophecy. And Yeshua says, truly Elias shall first come and restore all things. What's restoration of all things? When Israel believes that Yeshua is the Mashiach, that is the restoration of all things. Daniel's prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, that's the restoration of all things. Did John do that? You know, John was dead when they asked him the question, by the way. John was already dead, but he said, truly, he will come. He puts it in the future. He's going to come. Yes, I agree. He's going to come, and he's going to restore all things. So, and believe me, there's all kinds of Elijahs out there. I've met them. I've met Moseses, too. You think I'm kidding you? And when I say this, I'm not saying this to mock if, if those two witnesses, because I, I do lean towards the idea that it'll probably be two men anointed with that, with not their spirit. It's not going to be Moses and Elijah reincarnated, no. But in other words, God will bring the same Holy Spirit that he had placed on them with the same gift, the same anointing, and put it on two men likewise. Just like not only was Elisha, was the spirit of Elijah on Elisha, but also God told Moses, that Joshua would be a prophet in his room. So the same type of anointing went on Joshua. And Joshua took and carried on Moses' ministry. So we do see that God does work like this. And Yeshua said the same thing about John the Baptist. So why do we think God would change his way of doing it? Doesn't it say Hebrews 13, 8, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever? I mean, I'm sorry, maybe God changed his program. So I, when I say these things about, I've got all kinds of Moses, all kinds of Elijah, I, you, honestly, you have no idea how many people write me and say this to me. But maybe, maybe one out there really is. Maybe one of those has actually watched, this, watched these videos. I, I don't know, you know. I personally think, though, whoever Moses and Elijah are, or whoever God will anoint with that spirit, I don't think it's going to happen until the time is for God to send them. So I th this is what troubles me. And not to mention, I don't think they would sound, uh, sound, sound the trumpet and go tell the world that they're this or they're that. Like the guy that writes me the letter and everything. You know, you have to understand the two witnesses are to Israel. They're not to the Gentiles. They're to Israel. And if they're two men anointed by the Holy Spirit to have the same anointing that Moses and Elijah had upon them, they're, 
<laughs> it's not going to happen until that time comes. Let, let me share something with you, though. I'll, I'll show you something, though. Because some people, a, a lot of people have always questioned, and, and, and so I know there's a lot of new people always. There's, since I last spoke on the two witnesses, there's probably been another 3,000 people that, that have uh, come onto the ministry here. So let me just share some things with you. It's, it'll be redundant for, the, for probably eight, eight 9,000 of you. Uh, but in some cases, for several thousand of you guys that have never heard me speak about this, it'll be like, whoa, never heard that before. Let's go to the book of Exodus. Um, I'm over here in Bereshit and Genesis right now, but let me get you into the book of Exodus here. I want to just share with you some of the reasons why I think even scripturally it supports that it's not uh, Enoch. Uh, I remember when I was on Chuck Missler. In fact, by the way, I'll be uploading some more on Chuck Missler. I know Chuck has really fallen for the this nonsense about um, the Muslim Mahdi and stuff like that. Uh, it really saddens my heart because at one time I, I had warned Chuck about that, and and he actually listened. I was surprised he actually listened. Chuck, Chuck is the type of man, if you can convince him biblically, if you can show him biblically that something's wrong. Um, he will listen. But then he ended up drifting back in the same camp because while he's, shot, uh, he's got so many credentials that Chuck has just really gone off in another direction. But I'm going to share with you guys some more of the interview that me and him did together because it's kind of interesting anyway, and I've had so many people ask me about that interview. Um, all right, let me just share with you some things here in, uh, in Exodus. One of the, some of these are what I call the unfulfilled prophecies of Moses. Um, Moses asked God here, he says right here, Moshe Okay, so he's saying to saying to God, you know, he says uh, Moses says to God, uh, behold, I will come unto the children of Israel. And 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 they will and, and I will excuse me and I will say to the, no they will say to, I will say to them uh, uh, the God of thy fathers has sent me un, unto you and I'm just translating this myself so forgive me if it's not like you're reading in your own Bible but close uh, then he says ve'amruli mashimo and they will say to me what is his name now God says to Moses something very interesting after this here when Moses asks this question. Um, then he says, He says, What do I say to them? And God says, And, and the Lord says to Moses, Now, what does this say here? It says here, uh, a lot of people translate this, I am that which I am. But in reality, it's, it's more of a future tense expression here. It's like God is saying, I will be that which I will be. God, in other words, God proves who he is by what he says that comes to pass. So in one instance, we could say that when everything that Moses said, God brought it to pass, that is, Ichaye, Asha, Ichaye. Okay, secondly, it's interesting because when Yeshua comes on the scene and they ask him, they said, because uh, he claims to have seen Abraham the way he expresses one of his uh, sayings there. And they said, you're a man under 50 years old and you say you've seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Now, the King James says, I am he, but he is in italics. Notice that it's in italics. He doesn't say, I am he. He says, I am. Now, in the Greek language, he puts it, what we are translating in Hebrew, which is not actually correct, he puts it as being present tense. In other words, I am, I am now, I am God. Now, I didn't bring you to this point to say that. Forgive me for those of you that hate it when I shout. I know you brothers and sisters that love it when I shout. Thank God for you. And, uh, um, you know, you know, it's funny. People don't like shouting and screaming. What are you guys going to do? On the, uh, <laughs> what are you guys going to do uh, that, that make it into heaven? Do you realize all the shouting and screaming going to be going on there because we made it? And I hear down in hell from some of the dreams that people tell me about that uh, there's a lot of crying and wailing and weeping down there. You'll be a miserable person 
if you don't like it somewhere. So anyway, but I, I do understand too, though. I mean, you guys that don't like the shouting, you're trying, you, you're, you're probably more in depth in your studying. You want to think like that. You're not used to the anointing side of that. So I, I understand. I, I do understand. I do have some teachings on there like that. Maybe I should put that in the, in the, in the, in the little section here. Video does not contain shouting. That way. So <laughs> I'm not making fun of you guys. Honestly, I'm not. I just think it's kind of cute. I really do. But anyway, I want to bring this out to you. Beyomet Elohim el Moshe. And God says to Moses, Ihaye asha Ihaye. But notice what he asks. So the question he asks. Beyomru li Mashemo. And they will ask me, what is his name? Shem Mo. Shem is name. The O in there is his. It's like backwards. Name his. What is his name? Okay. But God does not answer Moses with his name. In fact, what's ironic is we can't find anywhere in the Torah where they ever ask Moses, by the way, what is God's name? So it literally is an unfulfilled prophecy. If they never asked Moses, and so therefore Moses, I mean, he does tell them the name of God later, but it's not because they ask, it's because God reveals it and he tells them. But it, it doesn't end there. This is what gets interesting. You go into chapter 4, and I won't, I won't sake of time. Let me just, I'll read in English for you only to save some time for you. Um, Moses is complaining to God. He says, uh, I think it's in part of verse 10 here, he says, uh, but I am slow of speech and, and slow of tongue. And the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth or who makes a man dumb or deaf or seeing or blind is it not I the Lord now therefore go and I will I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say God just tells Moses he's going to heal him I'll, I'll take care of it don't worry about it he's standing in the very presence of almighty God and God tells him go I will be with your mouth do you realize, it's funny, because, you know, not long ago I did a, I did a message on codes, and, 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 and I, as I said in there, I got brothers that I love dearly that do Bible codes, you know, but I've I gotten kind of after the people that are putting too much emphasis on codes, you know, but it was, in, in saying that, though, I, I do believe that God has hid things in codes. I, I, I can't say that I understand how it works. My, my only issue with codes, though, was a lot of times is that I was afraid that people are taking using the code and then trying to uh, prophesy by it, you know, because there are people that are doing that. Now, not, some of the people I know don't try to do that, but, but there are people that do, and a lot of times it doesn't happen, and then it causes people to stumble. That was my issue with that. But my own name was done by a Jewish rabbi. And the name Danun, it has skipped space of 17, is in three verses. Right here. And it's and that's what's kind of funny. It's right there where he says, I will be with your mouth and I will teach you what you shall say. Now the ironic thing about that was is I've always prayed and asked God to be able to speak to my own people. I wanted to understand Hebrew fluently. And because I suffer with dyslexia, I can't it's hard for me to learn a language. It's very difficult. Sometimes I do well with Hebrew, sometimes I stutter around with it and have a hard time with it because of that issue. So I really sincerely prayed before God and asked Him to help me. And when I still could not seem to overcome it, I could not get to a fluent place in the Hebrew language, I asked Him one day, I said, Lord, show me in Your Word. How do I know that You would help me with something like this? Because I'm thinking of divine healing and things like that. You know, God can heal you if you've got a problem. Help me, Lord, to where I can learn this language. And I said, Lord, help me. I said, let me open Your Word so I would know where You would speak to my heart. I actually opened to this very verse. I just closed my eyes, opened the Bible, put my hand there, and opened, took my hand off, and there it was. I'm like, whoa. I'm like, God, if you can do that for Moses, you could do it for me then. Not knowing that nearly 10 years later, my name would be actually be sitting in this verse. So I kind of thought that was ironic. Anyway, another sidetrack bad about that. Maybe that's a dyslexic habit. Who knows? All right, so he says, I will be with thee, and I will, I, I will teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, Send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Moses prophesies of the man that will actually take his place. Isn't that interesting? Moses is prophesying about the guy over here in Revelation 11. 
Do you know this is why God doesn't actually call them by their names in Revelation? He just calls them my two witnesses. Because it's not Moses, it's not Elijah, it's not even Enoch. It's two men anointed with that spirit. If God was going to send back the literal Elijah and Moses, or if it was going to be Elijah and Enoch, or whatever the case may be, you think God has a problem with saying that? No. But the same God that did the miracles that those men did back 3,500 years ago or 3,000 years ago will repeat again in two witnesses. Interesting, isn't it? And so Moses says right here, I pray thee by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Oh, my Lord, send, I pray thee by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And it was kind of ironic. He's basically asking God to give the gift to the one he's going to send. Well, that brings us to another point then. All right, so the, the, the other issue is the, the fulfillment of God's, of, of the question that, 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 that Moses said they would ask, which by the way is a prophecy as well, it is a prophecy because he is a prophet and he is prophesying. He is saying to the Lord, they will ask me what your name is. Well, if they didn't ask him what God's name is, and something that serious would have been written in the word. And Moses says here, O oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of whom thou wilt send. That's still got to be fulfilled. Well, you know what's kind of ironic is in the day we're living in now, we don't know God's divine name. In fact, the commandment of God is take not the Lord thy God's name in vain. Why? Because God knew there would come a time where his divine name would not be known. It would be lost. Now, Oh, there's so many people that think, oh, no, we know what it is. We can prove it. We can, we can do this, this word study, that word study and everything. And, and this is how we know what God's divine name really is. Really. Okay, guys. We know that it's this. We know it's that. The Lord revealed it to me here. Or the Lord revealed it to me there. Please understand. I'm not, gonna, I'm not against what you, what you say the Lord has revealed to you. I'm going to tell you what the word of God says, though. That's why I told you, I'll never play, play church with you guys. I, I'm very serious with you because my heart is for your soul to be ready when he comes. It says in the book of Zephaniah, the prophet. All right. And let's go to the eighth verse, starting chapter three, eighth verse, Zephaniah. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord. God doesn't want you getting ahead trying to figure something out. He says, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord. That's God's commandment to us, to me, to you, to anyone else. Wait, what are we supposed to wait on him for, though? This is what I don't get. What are we supposed to wait about for him for? Okay. Okay, let's see then. Until the day that I rise up to the prey. Wow. Here comes a day that he's going to rise up. Do you know that's also the fulfillment of Revelation, uh, the seventh seal, when it says there was silence in heaven for the space of a half an hour? Also, we find out how we, how do we know what that is in the seventh seal in Revelation? Because it also is written in the Tanakh, where it says, let all the earth keeps silence, for he has risen up out of his holy habitation. When God rises up out of his holy habitation, what's he rising up out of his holy habitation to do? Well, it's written right here in Zephaniah. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with the fiery fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. So what are we supposed to be waiting on? 
Wait ye upon me, saith the Lord. We're supposed to be waiting upon him because it's going to be in that day that he says, I will turn to the people of pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, by the way, which is God's divine name. For beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. Mm. In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. See, you see Daniel chapter 9 coming into play here. Their iniquities, their, you know, all, all these things are forgiven for us. I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. He's talking about destroying the Vatican is what he's doing there. Now, let me, in closing, let me just share a couple more things with you. These two witnesses bring the plagues on, friends. And God says to come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins or the plagues. We're living in an hour that we're about to see these things fulfilled. And that's why I wanted to really sincerely bring this to your heart. By the way, for those of you who are talking about the two witnesses, let me give you one more uh, so you know that what I, when I say that it's the spirit of Moses coming. In Exodus chapter 15, and I'm doing this for the sake of those that have never heard me speak about this before, guys, so please just bear with me on this. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, Asherah l'adonai ki ga'orgo'o sus verekevora mabeyom. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea. Moses speaks of a future redemption. If he was singing about Pharaoh's army and Pharaoh being drowned in the depth of the sea, he would have had to sing this in the past tense, but he sings it in the future tense. Even Rashi, the great Jewish commentator, wrote that undoubtedly this would be fulfilled in the Messianic age. Another prophecy that's not been fulfilled. In fact, if you look at Revelation 15, we find that there's this group that come out on the sea of glass, mingled with fire. Another exodus, isn't it? And they sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Sounds like a bunch of Jewish people that ended up believing that Yeshua is Messiah, doesn't it? All right, real quick, as we close, let me take you again to um, Malachi, the first chapter of Malachi. Um, guys, I'm, uh, my Jewish brothers, forgive me, I, I'm using the Christian Bible because it's a little bit faster rather than me keep switching back and forth. Uh, I'm not going to be reading in Hebrew anymore at this point anyway. So, just for the sake of time. You wonder what's going on in Israel right now. It's the, why the Vatican is getting this upper hand. You know, God is just picking back up where time left off at 2,000 years ago. They were looking to, to Yeshua to deliver them from the hand of the Romans. So, God is literally putting everything back in place the way it was 2,000 years ago so He can deliver the children of Israel from the hand of the Romans at last. Uh, and they can see that things were picked back up. That's why you see that the, the 70 weeks of Daniel, the 69th and the 70th week, there's a separation of time. But the thing is, the events never stop unfolding. So therefore, what happens is at the beginning of Daniel 70th week, part 1, then it picks back up from where Yeshua actually died on the cross and rose again. So he did rise again. So therefore, something must happen from day 1 forward that God begins to deal with the Jews, with Yeshua's spirit, somewhere, somehow, in this time frame, dealing with the Jews once again. All right. Now, it says in Malachi chapter 1, verse 1, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob. And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. 
Whereas Edom saith, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Uh, for your eyes shall see, and you shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. Now what is, what is he talking about here? Edom Esau's descendants, basically, they become Edom, and this is the Romans of today. And yes, they do build a what, the desolate places, which Yeshua clearly identifies the desolate places being that he says that uh, Yeshua, when he's weeping over Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, he says, O oh, Israel, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. Your house is left unto you desolate until you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now, this is kind of like a twofold prophecy right here because it says we will build the desolate places. All right. Now, what does it mean by places? One, we realize that when Jesus says your house is left to you desolate, he's referring to two different houses. One, he's referring to the house, the temple that is there on the temple mount being destroyed. Because he said in another place, there will not be one stone left upon another. But in this case here, he's talking about the individual Jewish person in his own heart. His heart would be left desolate. In other words, he would not receive the Holy Ghost that was given to him for the very purpose of redemption. Because why? Israel had to reap for what she sowed. Keep in mind, if God took and kept the Jewish people down in Egypt 430 years because of the sins that they did against Joseph, what do you think will happen for the sins that were done against Yeshua? But like in the case of Joseph, his brothers shed the blood of the goat and they sprinkled upon his coat and God accepted it as a sacrifice for their sins. The same thing God does for the children of Israel that, that offer up Yeshua to the Romans to be crucified. And they cry out, let his blood be upon us and our children. And God accepted it as a sacrifice for their sins. And you think Jews have been lost for the last 2,000 years? That's not according to God's word. Might be according to some preacher that preaches nonsense against the Jews, yes. Everybody tells me, oh, Brother Steve, you know, you got to believe on Jesus Christ. Anybody that doesn't believe on Jesus Christ, he won't be saved. Believe me, let me tell you something. Jesus himself said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. If God has forgiven them and they don't know what they do, do you think sin can be imputed to someone that's been forgiven? And that blood atones for them. No wonder why we see in the fifth seal there were souls under the altar crying out, Lord, how long do you avenge our blood of, uh, upon those who have killed us? Avenge the blood? They're crying out for vengeance? Do you see a Christian doing that? Stephen was the first martyr. Do you see him crying out for vengeance? The Father, like Jesus, for the Father, forgive them for what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. The word of God and the, and the laws of God and the law of Moses clearly says if they do not know what they, if, if you do not know what you're doing, does not the Lord God consider the thoughts and intents of the heart and will he hold it to you? Nay! So, now, so it says here they're going to build the desolate places. In other words, they're going to build what they call the third temple. It's not going to really be the third temple, but they're going to build a temple, supposedly for the Jews. The place is, though, they're also claiming to be that the Pope of Rome is God on earth, and therefore he's the one that gives you the spiritual life. That's why God says he'll tear it all down, all the churches that go and join in with the Vatican in this ecumenical movement will end up being thrown straight into hell. When you see that the, 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 the false prophet are, and, and, and the beast, are, they're both thrown into the lake of fire. The beast is just the system that gave the, gave the false prophet his, his, his power. John, when he looks over here and when he's writing the, his 1st John, 2nd, 3rd John there and he talks about the Antichrist there, when he gets into the book of Revelation, he just, he, he realizes the Antichrist spirit, as the Bible says, has always been, it's moving down through time from one pope to another pope. It was in those early church fathers that a lot of people call the early church fathers. Many of them are not godly men. It's kind of interesting what they, you know, they make sure you know what books they want you to read. 
Oh, gosh. Thank God he's coming soon. Okay, Ezekiel 35, guys. That's what we're going to close with. Let me take you real quick to Ezekiel 35. Just this again. It's just another place to, 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 to kind of cinch this down and clinch it. Uh, I've really kept you a long time, and I apologize. It's been so long since I talked with you. I, I just feel like I've got to tell you some of these things. It says, Thus will I make Mount Seir most desolate, and cut from him that, pa that uh, passeth out, and him that returneth. See, that's because everybody goes in and out of the Vatican. That's what he's talking about. He's, he's going to cut it off where you can't even go no more. All you world dignitaries and you church leaders, you Kenneth Copelands and all the rest of you and everything, you, your, your days are coming. You won't even be going there no more. And I will fill in his mountains with his slain men and thy hills and thy valleys and all thy rivers shall they fall that are slain with the sword. I will make thee a perpetual desolation and thy cities shall not return and you shall know that I am the Lord because thou hast said these two nations and these two countries shall be mine. That's because they made of Israel two nations. God never intended Israel to be two nations, but they made of it two nations. And he says, we will possess it whereas the Lord was there. That identifies the fact that it's Jerusalem. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thine envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I have judged thee. When does God make himself known to the Jews? When he brings judgment upon the Jews. Okay, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord and that I have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying they are laid desolate, they are given us to consume. Oh, gosh. Now, let me go to verse 14. Very important here. Thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. So when is God going to destroy the Vatican? Well, it's easy to find the answer to that too. He says there, when the whole earth rejoices. So when does the whole earth rejoice? In Revelation chapter 11, it says, And the people and the kindreds and the tongues and the nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. This is after they kill the two witnesses after their three and a half year ministry. Then it says here, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because their two prophets tormented them, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So when the earth rejoices is at the death of the two witnesses, and that's when the Vatican will be destroyed. I'm Stephen Denoon. I'm so sorry that I kept you this long. God bless you. More to come. Baruch Hashem.